Welcome, my name is Bijan Jamshidi, and today I'm going to be going over some of the best gaming monitors. I was thinking of making this video sometime in January since there will be a lot more monitors available then, but then I thought, wait, Black Friday and Cyber Monday is now, and I wouldn't want you guys missing out on some great deals if you were on the fence about a certain monitor. This also doesn't apply to just Black Friday and Cyber Monday, but throughout Christmas as well. The categories I'll be going over are 1080p 144Hz, 1080p 240Hz, 1440p 144Hz, and 1440p 240Hz. Also, since I don't have a PS5 or an Xbox Series X, I won't be recommending anything in particular for the next-gen consoles, since I have no clue what works best, because 120Hz support seems finicky on the next-gen consoles, plus I think Sony is stupid for not including 1440p support. A couple more things before we get started. Keep in mind that I won't be able to talk about every monitor on the planet. There are a crap ton of monitors being released all the time, and because I work full time, I just can't get to every gaming monitor that matters. With that said, I'll be focusing primarily on the monitors I've reviewed already, and might throw in some monitors that I haven't tested myself, but think are a good alternative or runner up. Also, I've never done one of these videos where I lay out the top products for any category, so if you guys have any suggestions for future videos like this, let me know down in the comments below. Lastly, if you're considering buying any of the stuff featured in this video, if they're even in stock, I'll leave links in the video description. By the way, everything is based on US pricing. Okay, enough jibber jabbing, let's begin. We'll start with the 1440p monitors, specifically 144Hz, because that seemed to be the most popular monitor based on the nearly 9,000 votes I received from you guys. And I can see why. Not only have they dropped down in price considerably over the years, but at the price you can get them at now, they offer a great balance between high refresh rate gaming, great color reproduction, depending on the monitor, and high pixel density, giving you those crisp images. Now, when it came to choosing which one I thought was best, it was a super close fight between the LG 27GN850 and the Dell S2721 BGF. Both of these monitors are pretty much the same, minus the design, but the Dell wins slightly overall. Design-wise, I think the Dell looks better between the two. I never liked V-shaped legs compared to a square base, because you don't get the freedom of pulling a monitor as close as you can with a square base. Now sure, you can use a monitor arm to solve this, but I'm not worried about that for this video. In terms of I.O., or input-output, the Dell wins this hands down, including the standard two HDMI 2.0 ports and one DisplayPort 1.4 port, just like the LG. But the Dell takes it a step further by including four USB 3.0 ports to expand your USB needs further. Other than that, they both use similar, if not the same panel, with the Dell being jacked on steroids, giving you a refresh rate of 165Hz, rather than the LG's measly 144Hz. Both have 8-bit plus FRC support to give you the 10-bit color depth, and both are obviously 1440p. They also performed very similarly when it came to peak brightness, contrast ratios, gamut coverage, and out-of-the-box color accuracy. Now, when it comes to the gaming performance, that's where the LG pulls ahead. Now, just a disclaimer, I did do these tests with the Alien set to 2400 pixels per second. Almost all of the other tests, if not all of the other ones, will be set at 1920 pixels per second. I'm not going to explain in this video for the sake of your attention, so if you're interested in finding out why, I'll leave a link in the video description. Anyway, at 144 plus hertz, the LG does the best when compared to the Dell by producing an image that's slightly more clear when using the fast overdrive setting. Now, is this something the average person will notice when doing a blind test between the two monitors? Absolutely not. So if you're eyeing the Dell, but now you're thinking of getting the LG because it's slightly better pixel response times, don't, because you won't notice these differences in the real world. The LG does have a higher mode called Faster, but it looks identical to the Dell's Extreme Overdrive setting, so I saw no point in adding it, not only because there's no point, but also because I just don't have any more space. Now when it comes to the Black Equalizer, they both perform pretty well, making dark areas quite bright so you can see those pesky campers hiding in dark areas. The Dell takes it one step further though by including a color vibrance feature in the form of color saturation, which lets you add more colors when needed so people can't blend in with their background as easily. Then lastly for the gaming aspect was the input lag, which felt identical on both monitors, as expected. So overall, I don't think you should decide based on their gaming performance, unless you value the color saturation, simply because they're very similar. At this point, it's a matter of which brand you like more, if you need the Dell's USB hub, if you want V-shaped legs or a square base, 
which design you like the most, and if you want a software controlled OSD, which the Dell has with their display manager, but the LG does not. If I were to choose, I'd personally go with the Dell simply because it has everything the LG has, except a better design in my opinion. It has a higher refresh rate, it has color vibrance, and a USB hub, all for a slightly higher but justified MSRP. By the way, if you want the LG with a USB hub, the 2019 GL850 model is the exact same monitor as the 2020 GN850, but with a couple of USB ports on the back, as well as with the older stand and leg design. For the participation award, that goes to the Samsung Odyssey G5. When I reviewed that monitor, I was hoping that it would have similar pixel response time improvements that the G7's VA panel had, but I ended up being more disappointed than my Persian dad when I told him I was dropping out of college. Now don't get me wrong, the monitor isn't bad. It does great when it comes to media consumption with its measured 2200 to 1 contrast ratio, good out of the box color accuracy, at least from my unit, good sRGB coverage, and a good peak brightness. But when it came to gaming, pixel response times were… how can I say this lightly? Bad. They were bad. But once you enabled backlight strobing, or MBR as Samsung calls it, pixel response times were much better. The only issue with the backlight strobing is that it lowered the peak brightness from 300 nits down to 150 nits, making it a bit darker than some people would prefer. It also had a pretty good black equalizer, making those dark VA blacks much brighter so you can see enemies hiding in dark areas, but it doesn't include a Kylo Vibrance feature so things will stay washed out. It also doesn't have any adjustability other than tilt, and doesn't include a software controlled OSD, making it a little bit less easy to change your color profiles on the fly. Now this monitor isn't overall that impressive, so why include this monitor in this list? The reason why is because for $230, at least at the time of this recording, this might be one of the cheapest if not the cheapest 1440p 144Hz monitors on the market, and I think it's much more compelling at that price over its original MSRP of $300. Next is 1440p 240Hz. This one's a pretty easy choice as well. The absolute best monitor for the segment that I've reviewed so far is the newly released Alienware AW2721D. Starting with the basics, it has a beautiful 10-bit nano IPS panel that gets as bright as 500 nits on SDR, or standard dynamic range, has an average 958 to 1 contrast ratio because it has an IPS panel, and has G-Sync Ultimate. In terms of gaming performance, the input lag is very low, making it one of the most responsive monitors I've tested so far, alongside every other 240Hz monitor I've tested yet. Pixel response times are also extremely good, especially for an IPS panel, doing a good job keeping up with Alienware's new 360Hz model and the BenQ Zowie XL2546K, as long as we're not talking about backlight strobing results, because as you can see, the 360Hz model and the Zowie leave the AW2721D in the dust when you enable their backlight strobing technologies. Now as I found out in the comments in the AW2721D review, Nano IPS panels don't get backlight strobing because apparently it looks absolutely horrible. I've never personally seen how it looks, but it's worth noting if you're someone who absolutely needs the best clarity. When it came to the black equalizer, things were pretty okay. It performed pretty much the same as the Dell S2721DGF, mainly because Dell uses the same black equalizer for all their monitors, at least that's what it seems. One thing this doesn't have, unlike the Dell S2721DGF, is color saturation. So scenes that are washed out will stay washed out unless you're using something like Nvidia's color saturation feature. Color accuracy out of the box was great, since Dell does some basic factory calibration before sending you your monitor, with my unit having an average delta E of 1.95 and an average delta E of 0.39 once I ran it through Portrait Calman's calibration software. It also had amazing gamut coverage, covering 100% of the sRGB color space, 84% of the Adobe RGB color space, and 96% of the DCI-P3 color space, so not only can you play on the highest level of competitive gaming, but you can do professional work on it as well. The only gripes I have on this monitor is that it doesn't support NVIDIA's ULMB backlight strobing technology, but that's more of a panel issue. It doesn't have color vibrance. It doesn't support Dell's display manager software, at least when I was doing my review on that monitor. And HDR is not that great. It's not bad, but the issue I had with it were the ugly vertical dimming zones, which grabbed my attention more than what I was watching when there was a dark scene. So overall, this monitor is great for people that want an all-in-one gaming and professional monitor. But for $1,100, this isn't for most people. However, when I posted the review for that monitor, it was going for $733 on Amazon, making it a stupid good deal. I have no clue if that was a mistake and if those orders were actually fulfilled, but if they actually were going for that much on Amazon, the Alienware AW2721D 
is an amazing choice. Second place for the 1440p 240Hz monitor segment is the Samsung Odyssey G7. Sadly, I lost all my files for the G7, so I won't be able to show you pixel response times the way I have been showing you throughout the video so far. So if you want to check out my review on that monitor, click on the pop-out banner over here. Basically though, it has extremely good pixel response times without backlight strobing, and does even better with backlight strobing enabled. But just like the G5, with backlight strobing enabled, it lowers the peak brightness from 332 nits down to 234 nits, which is still plenty bright for most people, but lower than the peak brightness. It also has very good contrast ratios at 2443 to 1, so those blacks will be more black than your standard IPS and TN panel, which should add more depth and immersion. The black equalizer was also pretty good. It does extremely well going from the default setting to the lowest setting, brightening up everything so you can see those pesky campers a lot easier, but the image will stay washed out since there's no color vibrance feature, just like the G5. Input lag was also on par with just about any other 240Hz monitor I've ever used, so if you're worried about input lag, don't be. You'll absolutely love it. Another thing you'll love is the panel. Well, mostly at least. It's got great camera coverage, covering 100% of the sRGB color space, 80% of Adobe RGB, and 88% of the DCI-P3 color space. So it's not quite as good as the Alienware, but it's still very good for some intermediate color work. Color accuracy was also extremely good out of the box, since Samsung calibrates all of their G7s before sending it to the customer. My unit in particular had a Delta E of only 2.22, which is very accurate, and 0.49 once I calibrated it myself. Design-wise, it's nice, but one thing I really hated when using it was how big the legs were. They were a whopping 16 inches long per leg and had a wingspan of 22 inches, so it really invades your desk. Other things I can't forget to mention includes the flickering. I don't think my unit had it, but that's probably because I keep adaptive sync off almost all of the time with any monitor. But if you buy the G7, make sure you're okay with having adaptive sync off to prevent the monitor from flickering. Samsung was supposed to release a firmware update to fix this issue, but I have no clue how that's going, so buyers beware. An issue I did have with my unit, as most people will, is the backlight bleed, which was very noticeable and bad on my unit. This is something you're going to have to deal with when buying a monitor with a curved VA panel, unless somehow you hit the panel lottery and get no backlight bleed at all. So this is another buyer beware. And lastly, we have the OSD. It's fine, but there's no software to control the OSD, so you're always going to have to play with the nipple if you want to change your color profiles. Anyway, as we speak, the G7 MSRP is for $700 and is currently going for $550 for the 27-inch model, which is Actually a very good price for what you're getting, as long as you don't mind its shortcomings. For the honorable mention, we have the Acer Predator XB273U GX. I haven't reviewed it yet, but I got it about two days ago, and I am absolutely loving it. This probably won't be on sale though, since it was just released, but if you're looking for something like the Alienware AW2721D, but with a much cheaper MSRP of $700, then look no further than this. Now it doesn't specifically say what type of IPS panel it is, all it says on Acer's website is that it has an IPS panel. What I can say is that it looks pretty much the same as every other nano IPS panel I've used so far, so I'm just going to say it has a nano IPS panel. Now I haven't gathered any actual data yet since I just got it two days ago and I'm working on this video, but as it stands, it's extremely responsive when it comes to gaming, pixel response times seem good, Color accuracy out of the box is great as they all have a factory calibration that guarantees a delta E of less than 2, and it lets me enable 10-bit all the way up to the overclocked 270Hz, whereas the Alienware is locked at 144Hz. Apparently they're working on a firmware update for that though, so we'll see what happens in a couple days. Now that's about all I can give you until I work on the review for the Acer Predator, but at $700, this is a great deal for everything that it's offering based on my first impressions. The only problem is that the monitor seems to be impossible to find. I couldn't find it anywhere other than Micro Center. If I had to choose between the Alienware and this though, I'd get the Alienware if, and only if, it was $733 like it was before it sold out. Next is 1080p 240Hz, which can go many ways. If you're looking for a monitor that'll give you the absolute best competitive edge, then look no further than the BenQ Zowie XL2546K. It has the best response time of any gaming monitor I've used so far, not only because of how clear the image is, because a lot of monitors with backlight strobing can achieve these results. What's impressive here is how clear the image is, all while not sacrificing any brightness. The XL2546K stays as bright as 320 nits with or without Diac Plus, 
which is why I love using this monitor so much when it comes to competitive gaming, among other things. The black equalizer is one of the best ones I've seen as well on any monitor, making dark areas much brighter and also including a color vibrance feature so you can distinguish enemies not just from the shadows, but also from their background if they're trying to blend in. Input lag is as good as it gets for 240Hz as well, being extremely responsive. The OSD is also one of the better ones I've mentioned so far, including their S-Switch remote, which allows you to hold one of the three profile buttons for three seconds to save settings to that profile, so you don't have to keep fumbling around with an OSD nipple. The only thing I think it does poorly is media consumption, with its poor viewing angles, typical contrast ratio of 1017 to 1, poor gamut coverage, and poor out-of-the-box color accuracy both pre- and post-calibration. Basically, this is an eSports-focused monitor, and nothing else. That doesn't mean you can't use it for media consumption though, because after using the Zowie for a few days after using a Nano IPS panel for a few months prior, my eyes got used to it and I wasn't worried about how colors looked anymore. Not everyone will feel the same way as me though, but some will. Now, if you want a 240Hz 1080p monitor that can do it all, the best one I've tested so far is the MSI MAG251RX. It can do pretty much everything the Zowie can do, but it has an IPS panel so the media consumption experience will be much better. It has great viewing angles, had an out-of-the-box Delta E of 3.33 so colors will be pretty accurate, had an average Delta E of 0.46 after calibration so colors will be perfectly displayed, has a peak brightness of 437 nits, a contrast ratio of 1183 to 1, and covers 96% of the sRGB color space, 70% of the Adobe RGB color space, and 77% of the DCI-P3 color space, so you'll have no problems doing some basic color work. As I said earlier, it can do pretty much what the Zowie can do, but fall short in a few minor things. Pixel response times are great without ELMB, producing an image I actually prefer over the Zowie, and does great with backlight strobing enabled as well, making the image super clear. The only issue with the backlight strobing on this monitor is that it decreased the peak brightness from 437 nits down to 169 nits when enabled, making it pretty dark for a good amount of users. What isn't dark though is whatever game you're playing as the black equalizer on this monitor is very good, doing almost as well as the Zowie by increasing the brightness of the dark areas very well, but not having a color vibrance feature so colors will stay washed out in these grayscale-ish color themed games. Input lag was also as good as it gets, being extremely responsive. And when it comes to the OSD, this was one of the best OSDs I've seen so far, as it includes almost all of the hardware OSDs functions within the software, and you can tie it into an application so when you open that application, it enables that profile automatically for you. There is no work you have to do. So I think the MSI MAG251RX is probably the best overall 1080p 240Hz monitor, since it can do it all, all while costing $140 less than the Zowie when comparing MSRPs, which makes it much more attractive to potential buyers. Discount-wise, there isn't much right now, but even at its normal price, it's still a great buy. Now, if you're wondering why I didn't include both the ASUS VG259QM and the Alienware AW2521HFL, mainly it's because as direct competitors to the MSI, they both just don't offer as much as the MSI, all while having a similar MSRP, or even more in the Alienware's case. Lastly is the 1080p 144Hz segment. When it comes to what I think is best, I think that goes to the BenQ Mobius EX2510. This is kind of like the MSI, where it does everything super well, and more. Viewing angles are great, since it has an IPS panel. Color accuracy is good out of the box, giving an average Delta E of 3.59, and does outstanding when calibrated, giving an average Delta E of only 0.44. Gamut coverage was also pretty good, covering 95% of the sRGB color space, 69%, nice, of the Adobe RGB color space, and 78% of the DCI-P3 color space. So you can do some higher level gaming and some basic color work. It gets bright at a recorded peak of 358 nits, and has a good contrast ratio of 1181 to 1. When it came to gaming performance, this did extremely well, carrying over a lot of the Zowie's tech. The response times were great for a 144Hz monitor, especially when backlight strobing was enabled, giving clear results all while not lowering the peak brightness, unlike all the other non-BenQ products I've talked about so far. The black equalizer was good as well, turning dark scenes into bright scenes so you can see enemies a lot easier and also includes a color vibrance feature to add colors when needed, like right now. Input lag was about what you would expect for a 144Hz monitor. It's no 240Hz or 360Hz display, but it does super well. 
Other special features I actually enjoyed when using this monitor that I now miss a lot since I've put it away, since I review a lot of monitors, are the speakers and eye care. The speakers in particular. Every time I wanted to show my girlfriend something, I could easily switch to the monitor speakers, which were very respectable and loud for 5 watt speakers. And now, since I don't use that monitor, I have to crank my headset and place them on my desk, hoping we can both hear what I'm trying to show her. So needless to say, I miss the speakers a lot. Then lastly, we have the eye care. The best part about that was the automatic brightness adjustment feature, which automatically adjusted the screen's brightness and white balance based on the ambient lighting to prevent eye strain. This thing was awesome because I just never had to do anything. The only thing I didn't like too much was the OSD. It's not terrible, but there's no software or remote to control it like BenQ's other products. By the way, if you're okay with poor pixel density and want a bigger screen, there's a 27 inch model called the EX2710. Now with an MSRP of $250 for the 25 inch model and 300 for the 27 inch model, if they're at least $50 off this holiday season, that would be a steal for what you're getting, at least for the 25 inch model, since you can bring it close to your face and make it seem like you bought a bigger screen than you actually did. An honorable mention goes to the AOC C24G1. If you want a cheap monitor that has good specs on paper, then this is for you. It has a 1080p 144Hz curved VA panel, a crappy OSD, a crappy black equalizer, no color vibrance, good pixel response times, which is surprising because it absolutely spanks Samsung's Odyssey G5, good gamut coverage, good out-of-the-box color accuracy, average peak brightness, and really high contrast ratios. The big issue I had with this monitor is that it had this weird grain effect on literally all the edges. But if you don't mind that, then this is a good option because it's probably the cheapest way to get to the 144Hz refresh rate life. And that's about it. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and hopefully this has helped you on narrowing down what monitor you wanted to purchase. As I mentioned in the beginning, there will be links to most if not all monitors in the video description if you wanted to buy something. And again, let me know if you guys have any feedback on how to improve these kinds of videos. Other than that, I won't bore you with any more nonsense, so have a great day every day. Peace.